Amen. Amen. First Thessalonians chapter 4 for our study this morning. Maybe you remember the story of the preacher who was preaching on the second coming of Jesus Christ. He was one of those guys that didn't believe in notes, but preaching spontaneously off of the top of his head. Well, he got so wrapped up in his message that he quickly forgot his main point. All he could remember were the words of Jesus, Behold, I come quickly. Behold, I come quickly. And so thinking that if he would just repeat this about six times, it would jog his memory, nothing happened. When finally he thought, well, if I just hit the pulpit real hard and say, behold, I come quickly, it will jar his memory banks. And he'll remember the rest of his sermon. So sure enough, man, he pounded the pulpit. And it fell off of the platform into the lap of a lady in the front row. A little humble he retrieved his pulpit head bowed down and he apologized to the lady when she quickly said preacher why are you apologizing you warned me eight times you were coming <laughs> we have seen in our study of first Thessalonians how this is a book about the coming again of Jesus Christ a subject of which, by the way, has seen some renewed interest, a surge of interest, largely because some of the movies that have recently been put out. If we'll go to the next slide, Cheryl. Folks seem to be interested in this whole notion, this whole idea that Jesus is coming again. And while that's wonderful, I want to share with you this morning that the coming of Jesus Christ should have more than simple interest an effect of interest in our lives but it should affect the way we live in fact it was John who wrote over in his first epistle that everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure and so it's wonderful that people are interested in the fact that Jesus is coming again but I wonder how does that really affect the way that we live that is what Paul is going to talk about in these opening verses of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 this morning. Join with me, please, as we read in verse 1. Finally then, brethren, we urge and exhort in the Lord Jesus that you should abound more and more, just as you received from us how you ought to walk and to please God. For you know what commandments we gave you through the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification that you should abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one should take advantage of and defraud his brother in this matter because the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also forewarned you and testified. For God did not call us to uncleanness, but in holiness, Therefore, he who rejects this does not reject man, but God, who has also given us his Holy Spirit. And so Paul begins this section, this chapter, probably best known for its description of the coming again of Jesus Christ in latter verses. But he begins this by pointing out how the fact that Jesus is coming again should affect the way that we live. Now we've seen him commending the Thessalonian believers for their love, for their, their faith, and for their hope. But as well as they were doing, he points out to them, going back to verse 1, how that they should abound even more and more, just as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God. Even though they were doing well, listen, there was room for them to continue growing. Because Christian, no matter how mature you feel yourself to be in the faith, there is always room to grow more and more. And that's what he's saying to the church here. That word abound actually is a word that means to advance or to increase. And so no matter where you are on the spiritual maturity spectrum or scale this morning, there is always room to abound and to increase even more and more so that we would walk in a manner that is pleasing to God. For you know what the commandments we gave you through the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God. You want to know what the will of God is for your life? I get that 
asked of me so often, Preacher, how do I know God's will? What is God's will for my life? Here's a clue. In not any uncertain terms, he spells it out here in verse 3. For this is the will of God, your sanctification. Okay. What does that mean? Sanctification. That sounds like a big theological term, a Bible school kind of vocabulary word. What does sanctification mean? Simply this. It means to be set apart from the world. And it means to be separated unto God. It means that you are separated from the world and you are wholly the Lord's. Perhaps a, a, a very easy description of what this whole sanctification idea means is found over in the book of 1 John. Turn over there with me, please. 1 John chapter 2. We see a description, I believe, of what sanctification really is. 1 John chapter 2. Join with me, please, in verse 15 where we read, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God Interesting, the will of God abides forever. What is God's will? That we be sanctified. That we love not the world or the things that are in the world. Simply put, what that means is that you and I are to no longer be involved in worldly things. We are no longer to be dabbling in the things that we used to do. And yet I see so many Christians struggling in this area. They go back to that old crowd. They go back to some of those vices. They go back to some of the things that used to trip them up and, and tear them down and ensnare them. And we are to be separated from those. There's to be a clean break. We are to have nothing to do with that. We are the Lord's. And we belong to Him. And so these things should not be a part of our lives any longer. I see Christians still struggling or still dabbling with things in their past. Every now and then I'll have a Christian ask me, Well, Pastor, is it okay if I smoke a joint? Is it okay if I drink a beer? Is it okay if I do this or that? And really what they're asking in effect is, How close can I live to the world and still be a Christian? How much into the world can I get and still be a Christian? And it kind of reminds me of, of how when I was growing up, and, and even as we have employed in our home raising our kids, you know, my folks kind of drew a line in the sand. They, they set boundaries, okay? They let me know what was acceptable and what was unacceptable. They let me know what the limitations were, and they let me know what the consequences were should I choose to step over the line. For example, Brian, be home by midnight. Knowing that I had to be home by midnight, inevitably, I would arrive on my folks' doorsteps at 11.59 and 49, 45 seconds, okay? I mean, I, I just had it down as to how long it would take me to get from my buddy's house to my front porch. I knew that I could squeeze another two or three minutes watching that movie or doing that or whatever, you know, and still get and, and push the limit, if you will. Not that any of your kids would ever seek to do that, but I raised four kids that, are, that, that seem to want to push the limit. You know, they kind of wanted to redefine the line you know, it's like, hey, that line's too restrictive. You know, uh, you're sheltering me. You're, you're, you're too strict is the word that we would hear. And so what, in effect, they're saying is, can we push the line back? And we live in a generation where people are not just wanting to push the line back, but they're wanting to erase the line altogether, where there's no boundaries, where there's no lines. And, and what's, what's um, okay for me, you know, it doesn't matter whether you approve or not. And so we see even in the realm of the body of Christ how we try to live as close to that line. We try to push the line. We try to get as close to the world as we can while still being a Christian. And I suggest to you that rather than trying to see how close to the world we can live and still be a Christian, as we've been set apart by Christ, we ought to be seeking to see how close to Christ we can live and grow as a Christian. You following me? 
I think there are a lot of Christians that struggle and unfortunately some of them tumble and fall because the world is not a nice place. And when you begin to even dabble in the area of spiritual darkness, man, let me tell you, the devil doesn't want to just eat his lunch. He wants to eat your lunch too. And when you start having a picnic with the devil, he wants your lunch too. He wants to take you down. He wants to destroy you. And so we are to be separated, the Bible says here, back to 1 Thessalonians. We are to be sanctified, for this is the will of God. And listen, folks, as so many inquire and ask what God's will is for their lives, I want to share with you that until we start doing what He has revealed to us in His Word is His will for our lives, we have no business expecting Him to show us any more of His will until we start walking in the will as He's revealed it in His Word. you follow me? When we begin doing the things that He's already shown us to do, only then can we come asking Him to show us more of what His will for our lives are. And as we see here that His will is for our lives to be sanctified, to be separated, to be holy. We'll talk more about that in verse 7 in a moment. Holy, devoted to the Lord. Listen to this alarming study that was conducted recently. It was a survey taken among evangelical Christians. Now, you know what an evangelical Christian is, right? You hear fundamentalist, you hear evangelical. An evangelical Christian is one who believes that the Bible is the sole and final authority for everything pertaining to life. Are we evangelical? Absolutely. The Bible is it. This is the authority. This is God's word. It's not, eh, these are nice suggestions, you know, oh, good ideas, God, but uh, no, this is it. This is his living word, the final authority. This survey taken among evangelical Christians discovered that 80% of those that were surveyed said that their Christianity does not affect the way they live their lives. 80% of those who claim this to be the authority in their life said that their Christianity does not affect the way that they live. There's something wrong with that, folks. There's a problem. And I propose to you that that is exactly why the church in America is so weak, powerless, and anemic. From time to time I pose the question, Pastor, where's the power? Why don't we see it like the book of Acts? Healings, miracles, signs, wonders, whoa! Why don't we see the power of God in the church? Because 80% of the church is saying, hey, our faith really doesn't affect the way that we live. What a horrible witness to the world around us. i got to share with you folks, I see the power of God. I see the power of God at work in Laos, in Turkey, in Thailand. I see the power of God at work in those countries that are holy, where the church is wholly devoted to the Lord. Often because they are persecuted and yes, even underground, where brothers and sisters' lives are on the line for simply naming the name of Jesus Christ. These are people who when we come, they ask us to pray for them. I'm convicted. I'm humbled. When I was in Turkey last February, every family whose home we met in, in the underground church, asked me, the American pastor, to bless their house, to dedicate their home. And I would walk away from every one of those encounters thinking, Oh, Lord, I need their prayers more than they need mine. And so listen, as I am getting ready to fly out tomorrow and head back that very same way and meet up with some of these precious brothers and sisters again, I have packed my bag with pictures of this church family and of this church facility, and I am going to distribute them to every underground church member that I get a fellowship with over the next 10 days. And I'm going to say, you know what, I really appreciate you wanting me to pray for you, but I'm asking you, I'm begging you, will you please pray for us? We need your prayers. And we really do. Because these people know what it means to be set apart for God. These people are a bold witness, even though they meet underground, for the glory of the Lord. You see, when 80% of evangelicals say their faith has no effect on the way they live their lives, there's something wrong with that, folks. No wonder the church in America is crippled, is limping, is handicapped, and is weak. 
Paul tells us very forthrightly here in verse 3, this is the will of God, your sanctification. And then he delves into specifics in the following statement, that you should abstain from sexual immorality. That each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one should take advantage of and defraud his brother in this matter, because the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also forewarned you and testified. Paul zeroes in now in an area where we need to be especially sanctified because it's an area that not only the early church and the early believers struggled with but believers today and the church today continue to struggle with and that's this whole area of sexual immorality. The word in the Greek is pornea. And as we've shared its definition and description before, it is a very broad, encompassing word that describes all kinds of sexual and sensual filthiness. Everything from pornography, to fornication, to immorality, to adultery, to homosexuality, the whole gamut, folks. And I would remind you, the people to whom Paul was writing to in this day, hey, this was a pagan society. This was a society where some of the false pagan religions of their day actually worshipped their foreign gods through temple prostitutes and priestesses that would go out and engage in sexual acts as an expression of worship. I ask you, if we do not see sex being worshipped in our day and age in America, oh, you don't have to look far to see that it is. Just open the Arizona Republic this morning where you will see women clad in nothing more than their underwear. Or turn on the television set where just a couple of seasons ago or now a couple of years ago the filmmakers in Hollywood really pushed the subject to have the first lesbian kiss aired on American TV. And now it's commonplace. And what's alarming is that through technology and the internet, this stuff comes into the comfort and convenience of our homes as just a point and a click away. I know guys that would never go out looking for a Playboy or Hustler magazine. They wouldn't want to be seen at Circle K buying such a thing. And now they don't. Because in the clandestine privacy of their own home, they can venture into this. And folks, don't think the Christian don't struggle in that area because the studies show that they do. And yes, even pastors and church leaders. Even within the ranks of our own affiliation of churches, we've seen guys in this very state go down because of sexual immorality. Paul says, flee those things. Don't have anything to do with it. Don't let it be named among you. You are holy the Lord. You are separated. That is filth. That is the world. That is about as polluted as it gets. Don't have anything to do with it. I mean, really, when you think about it, the people that are exploited because of the sex industry in America, I was reading an article a while back where they actually bring these young girls from struggling developing countries to America with the temptation of gaining a better life for themselves only to discover that once they arrive they're going to be put to work in the porn industry we are exploiting human beings and folks it gets no lower than that the scripture says have nothing to do with sexual immorality but instead verse 7 God did not call us to uncleanness but in holiness that is how we are to conduct ourselves folks we are to walk in holiness now I I understand I, I realize that positionally we are holy because we are in Christ. He has robed us with his robe of righteousness. We have the garment of his holiness. Positionally, God views you and me as holy. But practically, how does that work out in our lives? As we move about the community, as we go to work tomorrow morning, as we, as we do our thing in the grocery store or even coming and going to church, do people see that holiness of God evidence in our life? Again, the presence of Christ ought to make a noticeable difference in us before the world. Jesus said, 
Be ye holy as I am holy. Actually quoting the Father. He went on to tell the disciples that except your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, who in their day were viewed as the most untouchable righteous guys on the face of the earth, he says, except your righteousness exceeds that, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. What manner of people ought we to be in walking in holiness? Again, the fact that Jesus is coming again should affect the way that we live. We should be set apart from the things of the world. We shouldn't be dabbling in those things. We shouldn't be distracted, drawn into them, caught up by them. We should be walking in God's holiness in our lives. Continuing in verse 8, Therefore, he who rejects this does not reject men, but God who has given us his Holy Spirit. What Paul is sum summarizing this section by saying is, hey, you don't like this? You don't agree with it? Take it up with the author. I'm just a spokesman. I'm just a penman. I didn't say these things. God did. You can reject them, but you're not rejecting man. You're rejecting God. I think of the occasion back in the Old Testament when one day the children of Israel came to Samuel, who was governing them at that time as a prophet, and he said, Samuel, we want to be like all the other nations around us. We want a king. Now you see, up until that point, God had been their king. It wasn't a monarchy. It wasn't a democracy. It was a theocracy. It was God ruling the children of Israel. And as they now come to Samuel saying, we want to be like everybody else. Bad news, folks, when a Christian says, we want to be like everybody else. No, you don't. You want to be different. You want to be distinctive. You want to set the climate in your job place. You want to set the environment in your home. You don't want to be influenced by the climate. You want to influence the environment around you. We don't want to be like everybody else, man. We want to be different. If we're not, then the salt has lost its saltiness. What good is it but to be cast out and trodden under the feet of men? And so Samuel came before God, broken hearted, saying, Lord, what do I do? They want a king. They've rejected me and they want a king. God said, Samuel, they haven't rejected you. They've rejected me. And it's a sorrowful day when the people of God reject God as their king. Paul is saying here, if you reject this, you're not rejecting man. You're rejecting God, who has given us, notice this, His Holy Spirit. You see, folks, apart from the power, the mighty working of the Holy Spirit in our lives, we can't set ourselves apart. We can't do any of the things described in this book. It takes His Spirit to accomplish these things in our lives. Now, now you can be stirred by this morning's message. You can be stirred by reading the Word. And you can purpose and determine in your heart, that, hey, I'm going, to be, I'm going to be a better man. I'm going to be a better woman. I'm going to be different. God, watch and see. And man, you are going to fall on your face. You're going to skin your elbows, man. You're going to bump your nose. You're going to fall because you can't do it apart from the mighty power of the Holy Spirit working in us. You see... The beauty of God is that He doesn't tell us to do something and then step back and watch us do it. Rather, He tells us to do something and then He gives us the means to do it, His Holy Spirit. You've heard my cop stories, my war stories. When I was a police officer, the city gave me a badge. I took the oath I was going to protect the citizens of the community. But they didn't send me out on the streets without the proper equipment. And so they gave me a gun, and they gave me a club, and they gave me pepper spray or mace is what we called it back then. And they gave me all kinds of armament to be able to accomplish the task. The same thing is true of God. He doesn't call us to do something without giving us the equipment with which to accomplish it, to complete it. That comes to His Holy Spirit. And so it's His Holy Spirit we need to work these things out in our lives, to empower us and to enable us. And of course, that's what we desire and seek in times like these as we come together as His body, asking Him to minister that work in us. But, continuing in verse 9, Concerning brotherly love, you have no need that I should write to you, 
For you yourselves are taught by God to love one another, and indeed you do so toward all the brethren who are in all Macedonia. But we urge you, brethren, that you increase more and more, and that you also aspire to lead a quiet life. Note this. To mind your own business. Ooh, does your Bible say that? I like it. M-Y-O-B. Mind your own business, baby. Yeah. We'll comment more about that in a moment. And to work with your own hands as we commanded you, that you may walk properly towards those who are outside and that you may lack nothing. Okay. As we've seen Paul doing throughout this letter, once again here in verse 9, he commends these Thessalonian believers for their love. <clears throat> he's, he's complimented them for their love, for their faith, for their hope. And again, he tells them, you guys are lovers, man. You are lovers of people. You are lovers of men. So much so that, that your love is spread through all of Macedonia. And as, as wonderful as they were in this area of love, notice he says, but we urge you, brethren, that you increase more and more. Because you see, no matter how much love you've got, man, there's always room for more. And you are never more like Jesus Christ than when you love others like Jesus Christ. At the risk of dating myself, I remember growing up, one of the popular songs on the charts in my day went like this. What the world needs now is love, sweet love. It's something that there's just too little of. Words are true, aren't they? Just look around. As some of our soldiers' bodies are being shipped back from the desert sands of Iraq this very week, the murder, the carnage continues. A couple of weeks ago, we saw a schoolhouse in Beslan, Russia. 300 plus victims, still many more unaccounted for. And along those lines, saints, I shared this with the first service, I share this with you. Calvary Chapel of Jerusalem has struck out on a mission this morning. They split, they left Jerusalem, headed for Beslan, Russia. As you know, many of those families, many of those um, victims were Christians, Christian children, Christian adults. It seems that there's a great Christian population in Beslan, Russia. And Calvary Chapel, Jerusalem, is taking a mercy mission, and they're headed up that way. I wanted to go, but again, couldn't. But we see maybe getting involved somehow, some way in the future. But be praying for them, as there are a lot of hurting hearts in that part of the country. We look at car bombs going off, Israel and Iraq. It's something that there really is too little of. How the world needs more love. They don't need the Hollyweird kind of love, okay folks? They need the love of Jesus Christ. They need the love that you and I are filled with and should be flowing from our lives. And in fact, if the love of Christ is truly flowing from our lives as it ought to be, then doesn't it make sense? We need more and more. Oh yeah, Lord, fill me up. Fill my cup. I want to go love on somebody. And you see, that's my heart's desire in the trip that we are about to launch out on here tomorrow. I mean, who in their right mind would want to go to a country like Iraq? I remember the day when my son, who's in the Marine Corps, called me from police academy and said, Dad, I got my orders. Cool. Where are they for? Iraq. What? He says, yeah, but there's, there's a classmate of mine that's got orders for Japan, Okinawa. He wants to trade. What do you think I should do? I said, son, this doesn't take a rocket scientist. I said, they are shooting MPs in Iraq. They're not shooting them in Japan. Trade orders. He's now serving in Japan. That young man t took his place serving in the sands of Iraq. Something doesn't make sense, I understand, in the picture when I'm happy about the fact that my son is not in Iraq, but then now my wife has to see her husband go to Iraq? What, what, what? The one that could have gone didn't, and the one that doesn't have to go does. But again, 
as you heard prayed over at the start of the service this morning there are a lot of people that God loves in that country that need Jesus and if we, we can even stumble across one or two or a handful or a roomful then it would be well worth the trip Paul says that you should continue that you increase more and more and that you also aspire notices to lead a quiet life now I don't know how that works out in your life but I got to share with you, I, I, I'm a little troubled when I see Christians caught up in some of the, the demonstration movements that have characterized our generation. You know, they're protesting, they're carrying signs, they're standing across the street shouting slogans and, 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 and jeers at one another. And when I see Christians involved in that, don't misunderstand me, we have the freedom of speech in this country and I think we should express it. But when the scripture says we should lead a quiet life, I don't know how that is worked out when Christians seem to be doing things contrary to that. You see, when it says there that we should lead a quiet life, I, I think that if we draw attention to ourselves for anything, it shouldn't be because of our protests, it shouldn't be because of our demonstrations. If we draw attention to ourselves for anything, it should be because of Jesus Christ. People should see Jesus in us. That is what should draw their attention to us. Not the signs that we hold, the slogans that we shout, the John 3.16 that we throw over the end zone, you know, in the football game. I'm not down on that stuff. Don't misunderstand me. There have been folks saved by that, I believe. But the scripture says that we're to lead a quiet life. And admittedly, for some of us, that's a little tough. Because we're a little rough around the edges. We may be a little loud, you know. We may be a little rambunctious, you know. I mean, there are times when I speak my mind and then I realize that that's less mind that I have left that I could use. <laughs> really. And so I've learned not to speak so much my mind anymore. I'm trying to keep all the pieces intact. My driving, I've shared those stories with you. You know, we'd be cruising down the road and Alicia, you know, Alicia would say, no, 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 do it. We got Calvary Chapel right down the vent. Fine, we'll take it off. That's my answer. No bumper stickers, no Christians, no, no Christian paraphernalia. They won't know me from the next motorist. That, that'll solve the problem. No, 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 no. We are to lead a quiet life, a low profile kind of life. So that if we're noticed for anything, we're noticed because of Jesus Christ. And then he goes on and says, and also to mind your own business. And while I would like to say that that pertains to this whole area of busybody and gossip and all that kind of stuff, in the context it really doesn't. I, I think it's a good point, don't misunderstand me, but in the context here that's not what he's talking about. Because he says to mind your own business and to work with your own hands as we commanded you, that you may walk properly towards those who are on the outside, that you may lack nothing. You see, when it says that we're to mind our own business and we're to work with our own hands, what it means is that there's no freeloading in the body of Christ. Okay, you know what that means? Freeloading? It means that you don't try to live off of the generosity or the charity of others. Because there are people that do that. I remember years ago when we were up at the church in Winslow. I got a phone call from one of the elders in the church. and He said, Pastor, I need you to come over to my house. I got this guy in my living room asking for help. My first question was, how did he end up in your living room? But I ended up going over and, and, and visiting with this fellow, and he gave me the sob story. What was happening back in that generation, that was in the early 80s, is the guys and gals were getting a hold of the Calvary Chapel Church directory, and so they knew all the cities that had Calvary Chapels in them, and they would just go from city to city, and they would land on Calvary Chapel's doorstep with their hand out, begging for help. This guy's story was, my mom is dying in California, and I don't have any money to get there. Help. Well, because he was now sitting in my elder's living room, I realized that if we just served him up with a couple of slices of banana bread and blessed him in Jesus' name, that wasn't going to get him out of the house. And so I knew we were going to have to do something with this guy, so we fork over 60 bucks for bus fare from the Greyhound. The interesting thing is I happened to be a cop in the city at the same time, working the graveyard shift, and so as I was out on patrol, knowing that the Greyhound bus showed up at the Winslow station westbound at 11.35 p.m., I happened to drive by the bus station about 11.15 p.m. and scoped it out. And the bus came, and the bus left, and this guy was nowhere to be found. He took our 60 bucks and skipped town. Now. Fast forward five years later, we're now in our own church building. Five years later, we've matured a little bit. We've aged a little bit. We may not all look the same like we did five years earlier. And guess who walks through the doors of the church? 
that same guy with the same story. I looked at Ronnie, my elder, and I says, Ronnie, do you believe the lightning strikes twice? I says, look who just walked in here. And as, as, as he begins to land, this, my mom is dying in California, and I don't have any money to go help and see her. I grab the guy by the collar. I pull him back to the office. I sit him down and say, hey, buddy, you obviously don't recognize us, but do we ever recognize you? You ripped us off five years ago for 60 bucks, and what you're doing is wrong. You shouldn't be fleecing the people of God. Get out of here. I mean, the carpet was still smoking <laughs> as he beat feet down the street. But there are people like that out in the world, and yes, even in the body of Christ. We need to be discerning. Listen, we need to be discerning about the kind of help that we extend to folks. Because as I've shared before, what do you think the storyline of the prodigal son would have read if while he was eating out of the pig's trough, instead of coming to his senses and saying, I need to go back to my father's house, his servants have it better than I have it now. How would the story have read if he was eating out of the pig's trough and some well-meaning, good-intentioned Christian came up to him and said, hey buddy, here's a 50, go stay at Motel 6 and buy yourself a, a cheap steak dinner at Denny's tonight. You see what I'm saying? Sometimes we get in the way of God breaking a person and taking a person to the lowest level they can go so that they turn to Him in brokenness and repentance. We need to be discerning about how we help people because sometimes we aggravate and complicate the work of God going on in their lives. Am I saying we don't help people at all? That's not what I'm saying. This church doles out hundreds and thousands of dollars every year, paying people's rent, paying people's house payments, utilities, buying groceries, clothing, all of that kind of stuff. Health issues, health care. But we need to be discerning. And we need to take it to the Lord. And we won't allow any kind of freeloading or people living off of the, the graciousness and the kindness and the generosity and charity of others. And finally, as we begin to wrap this up, perhaps the most best-known verses in this chapter, verse 13. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. And Cheryl, if we'll go to the next slide there. We come to that event known in the scriptures as the rapture. This is a passage of scripture describing the rapture of the church. Now you may protest and say, wait a minute preacher, my Bible doesn't say rapture. In fact, nowhere do I even read of the word rapture. What are you talking about rapture? Well, it may not say rapture because you're reading an English Bible. But in the Latin Vulgate translation, which was translated before the English Bible, it says so, it says that. And we'll talk more about that in a moment when we get to verse 17. But notice how Paul begins this section of Scripture with some familiar words. He says, I do not want you to be ignorant. That is a phrase that he uses five other places in the New Testament. When Paul is writing about an important, pertinent subject, he prefaces his remarks. Not that, not that anything else in the Bible isn't important, but this is something he really wants us to get. He really wants us to understand. He starts by saying, I don't want you to be ignorant. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I don't want you to be ignorant. Later on, talking about the devices of the devil, Satan's tricks, he says, I don't want you to be ignorant. 
And now here concerning the rapture, he says, I don't want you to be ignorant. Areas, interestingly enough, that when the scripture says, I don't want you to be ignorant, Christians have wrestled with and struggled with throughout the centuries. Spiritual gifts, are they for today or have they passed away? Do people still speak in tongues and prophesy or no? Division, dissension, disagreement in the body of Christ. The devil's devices, can he possess a Christian or can't he? And the rapture of the church, is it real or is it fairy tale? Paul says, I don't want you to be ignorant, notices, <clears throat> concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. You see, the death of the Christian in the New Testament is always described in the terms of falling asleep. It's believed that that idea of Christians falling asleep when, in, when, when they've died it actually comes from the words that Jesus used back in the Gospel of John chapter 11. Remember how, how word was sent to him that Lazarus was, was sick and dying? And so Jesus, it says there, didn't drop what he was doing and rush to Bethany, but rather he continued on for a couple of more days. And the disciples are like, well, Lord, well, when are we going to go? What, what's up with this? You know, your, your friend is, is dying. We need to go. And Jesus turned to them and he says, Lazarus is asleep. And they didn't understand what Jesus was saying because they said, oh, he sleeps. That's a good thing. Maybe he'll get better. I mean, hey, we know that, right? When you don't feel good, take a nap, lay down. Maybe you'll wake up feeling better. Yeah. When finally Jesus turned to him and says, Lazarus is dead. Tries to spell it out, make it plain. But again, for the Christian, when you die, now listen, you, you really don't die. Does that make sense? You just kind of move is what happens. I mean, it's like you move out of this body into a glorified body, an eternal home. But when you look at that lifeless corpse, how, how, how can you describe it? They're not dead, but they look dead. But, you know, if you've ever looked at it, and I'm sure you have, they kind of look like they're sleeping, don't they? And so that's how the, the term became coined in the early church, and it's kind of carried on ever since then. And so what Paul is saying here is, I don't want you to be ignorant concerning those who have died in Christ, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. You see... The worldly person sorrows in a far different fashion than the one who has lost a loved one in Christ. You know what I'm saying? I've, I've done many funerals as a preacher. Some of the hardest funerals that I've done have been for non-believers. Especially non-believers who have committed suicide. That is especially a tough one. I did the funeral for the young man who shot himself in the head years ago out in front of the deputy sheriffs there at Little Bit Bar in White Mountain Lake. Maybe you remember that. It was hard, man. Because I looked at his family and his friends and they were just busted up. They were broken. They had no hope. They had no idea. You see, when a loved one who belongs to the Lord has departed, we know that they are in a place where there's no more tears, no more suffering, no more dying, no more cancer, none of this stuff. They are really better off than we are when you think about it. And so we don't sorrow like those who have no hope. We sorrow because we're going to miss them. We sorrow because it's like they've gone on a long journey. We're not going to see them for a while, but we are going to see them again. You see, that's the unfortunate thing because some people have taken, I am going to go a few minutes long, folks, so if you have a roast in the oven, bear with me, please. Maybe medium well is the way you'd like it. Um, not that this preacher is ever known to go long, of course. <laughs> But I understand Randy Franks kept you over a little long last Sunday, too. So uh, I, I am having a, a good effect on, on the guys that serve with us here in the body at Calvary. But some have taken this notion of, of, of sleep, and unfortunately they've run amok with it. They've come up with this erroneous theology called soul sleep, and maybe you've heard of it, that teaches that when a Christian dies, their body goes into the ground, and their soul kind of just goes into hibernation, just goes to sleep. Now, while well, some of you, that prospect sounds very good because you'd like to take a hundred-year nap. You know, who was that, Rumpelstiltskin or one of those people? I don't remember what it was, one of those fairy tale characters. That's not what's going to happen. When you die, your soul doesn't go to sleep. Paul said 
to be absent from the body is to be present at home with Jesus Christ. And in fact, the very next verse in our text here this morning, verse 14, proves that the souls aren't sleeping because we see, if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him, notice, those who sleep in Jesus. They're not sleeping, man. They're partying. They're hanging out with Jesus. And when he comes again, he's going to be bringing them with them. They're not waiting around. They're coming with the Lord whom they love. We're going to see them again. There's going to be that great meeting in the sky as depicted in that photo on the screen this morning. For this we say to you, by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and note this, with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. So we see how, how when Jesus starts to come out of heaven to call the church up into the air for this glorious reunion, this meeting in the sky, we see how that whole event begins with the shout of the archangel and with the sound of the trumpet. Now here's what's interesting. Back in the Old Testament, we see in Leviticus 23, Numbers chapter 10, how the trumpet would sound to assemble the people of God. They would blow the trumpet. They would sound the trumpet to call the people of God together for a holy assembly, a holy convocation. Now, with that thought, keep your finger here in 1 Thessalonians 4 and flip all the way to the end of the book. Revelation chapter 1. And look at verse 10 with me. John banished to the island of Patmos. They tried to boil him in oil and kill him. He couldn't. They tried to kill this guy in one way after another and they couldn't. Finally, they just banished him. They sent him to solitary confinement on this lonely island out in the Mediterranean. And what you would think was a bummer time was the most blessed experience he ever had as God gives him this vision of the last days. And he says in verse 10, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and I heard behind me a loud voice. Notice, as of a trumpet. Interesting. Keep that thought. And flip ahead now just a couple of chapters over to chapter 4 and verse 1. After these things, that's the Greek word metatauten. We'll talk more about what that word means in a moment. After these things, I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, Come up here, and I will show you things which must take place after this. I don't think I'm stretching the scriptures. I don't think I'm squeezing too much out of these verses when I consider what we hear back here in verse 16 of 1 Thessalonians 4. As Jesus is descending, the trumpet sounds. As we see John caught up into this heavenly vision now in Revelation 1.10, invited now to come up. Isn't that what the church is going to do? Come up, caught up in the air, Revelation 4.1, hearing the trumpet make that call. Folks, in my book... Revelation 4.1 has rapture written all over it. And this is why. Go back to chapter 1 and verse 19. Now, I didn't intend to do a study on the book of Revelation this morning. We will get there someday as we continue through the word. But suffice it to say that the book of Revelation, you know already, is the only book of the Bible with a built-in blessing. We see that, the one who, who reads this, um, the word of this prophecy. Um, we see that blessing there in chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed is he who reads and who hears the words of this prophecy and keeps those things. So it's a book that has a built-in promise of blessing. But verse 19, it also has a built-in outline. The book of Revelation is divided up for us. God provides us an outline through the words of Jesus to John. 
when he says, write the things which you have seen, the things which are, and the things which will take place after these things. Three things, the outline there. Write the things that you've seen. That's chapter 1. What did he see? Jesus walking in the midst of the lampstands, the candlesticks, the churches as we learn them to be. Write the things that are. What are the things that are? Well, in John's day, as ours, chapters 2 and 3, the church age, the age of the church, the seven letters to the church, which speak not only to seven churches in John's day, but represent the church age even in our own. And then write the things which will take place after these things, which is where chapter 4, verse 1, meditata, after these things, means that we're starting now in that third division, that third section of the book of Revelation. Have I lost any of you? Are you still with me? Here's what's interesting. As we start into that third section of the book of Revelation, which you know from chapter 6 all the way through to chapter 18, 19, describes the horrific events of the tribulation period. Seven years of hell on earth, literally. After chapter 5, you no longer see the church on the earth. In chapter 4, verse 1, as John is invited to come up to heaven, as he hears this from the sound of a trumpet, the church disappears off the face of the earth. For the seven years of the tribulation described in Revelation, you see no reference of the church. The saints that are spoken of there are those who have come to Jesus during the tribulation period, predominantly those of Israel. Remember back in Romans chapter 10, 11, and 12, where Paul, I'm sorry, uh, 9, 10, and 11, where Paul spoke about how all Israel will be saved as the Spirit is poured out on them? Some of you are looking at me with puzzled expressions this morning. Suffice it to say this, I believe Revelation 4.1 represents, in, in, in John's experience, what we're reading about here in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, and 17. That catching up, that snatching away from the church. Okay, now, now having said that, back to 1 Thessalonians quickly. Again, the objection is, uh, I'm sorry, let's go on to verse 17. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up. And circle those words in your Bible. Critically important words, caught up. Circle them, highlight them, star them, ask them, whatever you got to do, cut them out, whatever. Get your attention on those words, caught up. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Now, I want you to notice a couple of things. First of all, Paul says, then we. He numbered himself in this latter group. Meaning that he expected to see Jesus Christ return in his lifetime. He thought that he would live to see Jesus come in his day. That is exactly how Jesus Christ intended us to live our lives. Expecting him to return at any moment, at any time. Paul thought it would be in his day. I believe it would be in ours. Because again, we've seen from our study this morning, he who has this hope in himself, or he who has this hope, purifies himself even as he is holy. Believing that Jesus could come at any time is going to affect the way we live, isn't it? It should. I don't want to be seen doing those kinds of things if Jesus could come at that moment. I don't want to be seen drinking that, smoking that, looking at that, doing that. No way. It should affect the way that we live. But here's what's interesting. As I was preparing for the message this morning, I was reading some guys' commentaries and, and sermons. And one guy's sermon was entitled, Stop the Madness. And the whole gist of his message was, let's stop talking about this last day's Jesus coming stuff. And let's just be busy about doing kind, generous acts to others around us. And I'm thinking, oh, that's nice. You ought to join the Red Cross. Uh, you know, some of these other great humanitarian social organizations that do good for others around us. The fact of the matter is that Jesus left the church in a state of expectancy. So that we might think he could come at any time. Back in Acts chapter 1, when the disciples are there with their jaws hanging, looking at Jesus going up, the angel says, hey, what you looking at? The same Jesus is going to come back in the same manner that you've seen him go. Again, establishing an expectancy for his return. 
And so Paul was living with that expectancy. But then we go on and we read those words that I told you to circle, please. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up. Folks, that is where the rapture takes place. You say, not in my Bible. Oh, yes, it does. Listen. The word there for caught up in the Greek, which is the original language of the New Testament, you know that. The Bible is written in three languages. Greek is the New Testament. Hebrew is the Old Testament interspersed with bits of Aramaic. But in the Greek New Testament, long before it was ever translated into English, for you and me to have an English Bible, it was translated into Latin. And that was known as the Latin Vulgate translation, from which a lot of English translations have been taken. In the Latin Vulgate translation of the Bible, when the translators translated this Greek word harpazo, which means a snatching away, a catching up, a, a snatching up, when they translated that Greek word harpazo into Latin, the word they used was the Latin word rapturus, from which we get our English word rapture. And so while the word rapture may not appear in your English translation, the fact of the matter is, is it is still there in the text. Some of the more contemporary paraphrases of the scriptures use that word rapture. Because that's what's being talked about here. The dead rise first. Those that are alive and remain are caught up in the air. What's interesting is this picture depicts is back in the early 80s, a time when we were growing in, in, in faith at Calvary Chapel, West Covina. I remember there was just a real rapture craze in the early 80s. And that was because the nation of Israel had been established in the land 1948. David Ben-Gurion made that wonderful declaration that we're now a state, we're now a nation. And everybody concluded that a biblical generation was 40 years. And Jesus taught in all of that discourse that the generation that saw the fig tree bud would not pass away until all these things were fulfilled, which made us all think that 40 years, man, and Jesus is, is coming. Now you subtract seven years from the 40 for the tribulation period. Everybody had calculated this, man. I had Israel and nation 1948, 40 years later, biblical generation 1988, take off seven for the tribulation, 81, fasten up, baby, we're going. And so there was this, there was this heightened expectancy in the, in the early 80s that Jesus was coming for the church at any time. So much so that it's actually documented that some of Americans, some of America's airline carriers would not allow two Christian pilots to occupy the cockpit. Seriously. For what we see depicted in this picture. There were corporations that while not professing Christianity and not really theologically minded, just out of fear that maybe those Christians were right, actually allowed that to kind of influence the way they structured some of their operational aspects. Fascinating to me. And he didn't come then, and he hasn't come yet, but you know what? We're 20, 30 years closer to his coming today. And we're a week closer than we were last week. And we're an hour closer than we were when I started this message. <gasps> He's been speaking for an hour, Martha. Oh, my. No, not quite, honestly. <clears throat> but there's coming a day when we're going to be caught up in the air. If we don't die and go ahead to be with the Lord... Some of us are going to be flying in the sky. Now, I know that that scares some of you because my wife does not like to fly. She'll be the one screaming in the rapture, by the way. Really. <laughs> the beauty is that I think it's going to be so quick she won't know what hit her. I mean, bam, one minute we're here, the next minute we're there. In fact, somebody's kind of described this whole idea, you know, about falling asleep and waking up in heaven as, as like when you were a little kid, you know, and you remember watching TV out in the living room and just kind of falling asleep on the sofa. And then when you woke up the next morning, miraculously somehow you were in your own bed. How did you get there? Well, you didn't know, but mama or papa carried you there during the night. And that's kind of like what the Christian's experience in death is, you know. You, you close your eyes that one final time, you bid everybody farewell, and, and you wake up in eternity. How did you get there? Your father, your heavenly father, carried you to that everlasting home. You see, but this is going to be a glorious day because even those that don't know how to fly are going to fly. And for those that are scared about flying, you know, I, I'm convinced that it's going to be so quick you won't, you won't know what happened. 
It's going to be glorious. I've often wondered, well, Lord, what are we going to do when we reach a certain altitude? Are we going to need to put on the oxygen mask, you know, like in the airplane? You know, if we lose pressure, the mask will fall. Please put your mask on first before trying to assist somebody, blah, blah, blah. You know, the, no, what's going to happen? We're going to have a glorified body is what's going to happen. So then the inevitable question is, well, what about those people who've been cremated? You know, those whose ashes have been scattered all over, the fish have eaten them up, blah, 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 all that stuff. Hey, let me tell you, if God can make this frame out of the dust of the earth, he'll have no problem finding the ashes of your long-lost loved one, okay? It's going to happen. And I believe it's coming soon. And that's why Paul closes this section with this thought, verse 18. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Knowing that Jesus is coming again for you and me is a source of great comfort to the Christian. That's why I especially enjoy reading this passage of Scripture at believers' funerals. It is a source of comfort to know that our loved one has just gone on ahead of us and we will see them again. But as they are words of comfort for the disciple of Jesus Christ, listen, if you don't know Jesus... There's no comfort at all in these words. Because the fact of the matter is you're going to be left behind to face seven of the most horrific, terrible years in world history. The Bible described it as the Great Tribulation. A time when hell is literally unleashed upon the face of this earth. A time that God doesn't want to see any of us going through and so Jesus has made a way for that not to happen he's provided a way for us to be delivered from those days and that's by simply turning to him in faith turning away from our sins and turning to Christ who offers forgiveness that we too would join him on this appointed day and if you're one sitting here in our midst this morning who does not know Jesus, then before you leave this place, you can change that and ask Him into your heart and into your life as your Lord and Savior. You don't want to miss this experience. You don't want to miss this appointment. You don't want to be here for the events to follow. Let's pray.